dog to give them everything they needed. You're right about it, Miss Polly said. I know I'm right, hell! I done ruined my kids too. That's why black folks can't keep no young people in our communities no more. We send them away. We tell them to go find the life when they should have been teaching, when we should have been teaching them the beauty of the life we gave them. We didn't know no better. Our folks did it to us too. Black folks been doing this since the days of slavery. Tio felt his pockets for a pen, but finding none, he simply listened more intensely. Like not too long ago, I heard Helen Faye bragging about her child going to Harvard. Now, I ain't never been to no college, so I don't know too much about him, but I know Harvard must have been a white school from the way she was bragging about it. <laughs> What's she carrying on, Blue? You know she was carrying on. Her head was way back in the clouds somewhere, hollering, ha! <laughs> names of no black schools, but I know black folks don't brag about them like that. The shame is that they've been doing just as good a job or better before even Harvard would let any of our black asses up in there. <laughs> I know that's right, Mr. Somebody shouted. That show not the truth. We act like any child who go to black school had to, because white schools wouldn't let him in. Like this boy him. He pointed to T.L. We all know he was good in his books. That wasn't no secret. But when some of y'all heard he was going to a black school, y'all asked, why? Mm. T.L. looked away. Most denied Mr. Blue's accusations. Yes, you did. You said it. You said it. I heard you. You said it to me. <laughs> you thought since he was smart enough to study alongside white kids, he should have gone to one of their schools instead of going to a black college. I used to think like that, too. We all did. That's how they made us think. But then black schools did a hell of a job educating colored children. Wouldn't nobody else take them? I know what I'm talking about. We wouldn't be nothing without them. Look at Miss Swinton. She the best teacher in the whole state of Arkansas. Now that's true. And she went right down there to Philander Smith College right there in Little Rock. But see, here's the problem. People don't associate black with excellence no more. But they used to. Once upon a time, a black man could go in store and buy stuff on credit because folks knew his word was gold. If he told you he was coming back to pay you, that man was going to pay you. Amen. A few teenagers looked amazed. It's the truth. Word was gold. Why do you think they hired black women to clean their houses? Because when black women cleaned, they cleaned. <laughs> we always had to clean, clean this house around. Now, wasn't nothing in them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can show enough eat off that float. <laughs> I'm telling you, these are proud people, proud folks. Amen. The same was true for colored schools. If you went to one of them anywhere in this country, you was gonna come out of there knowing what you was supposed to know. They wasn't gonna have it no other way because they know what you was up against out in that world. I didn't go to no college, but I bet you them professors could teach up a storm. Mm -hmm. Tio raised his hands and said, I'm a living witness. <laughs> I know it, Mr. Blue went on, because I know what we was like as a people back then. That's what I'm trying to say to you folks. Didn't make no difference if it was home or school or church or whatever. We knew we had to be good if we was going to survive in this country, so most times we was twice as good. That made them hate us even more. That didn't really make no difference. We just thought it did. So we traded what we know for what we didn't, and you see what we got, don't you? T.L. marveled at Mr. Blue's wisdom. He wished he'd had a tape recorder. The day would come, he feared, when generations of black children would need this insight, and it would, it, it would be nowhere to be found. Mr. Blue sighed and said, but oh well, guess we're going to have to sleep in the bed we made, ain't we? Is that right, T.L.? T.L. turned and said, yes, sir, I, 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 I guess we are. All right, let's go ahead and turn these pages and tell this story. Uh, you know, this narrative that is so deep and so layered with so many strings and so many characters, each one very, very, very clearly delineated, right. yeah. each one with his own story. And I said, this is genius. And there was, nothing, there was nothing to say. It's like, well, you published three books. <laughs> and this one's genius. This one is the great American novel. Both of your comments and all of that. And in place, at least I do. Um, and I think that's important because in the creation of contemporary literature, I think it's important to have a good story. But I think it's also important for it to be well done. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the thing I'm really trying to move us away from, especially in the African American community, is, is this move towards just a hot story, but who cares how well it was yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, but it's a very delicate juggle. So I do a lot of rewriting, I do a lot of editing. Sometimes I'm on the same paragraph for two days. 
Mm. Just over and over. And sometimes I change it back to what it was originally, you know. <laughs> just going through and, and just trying to get it right and trying to get it right. It's a grueling, mm -hmm. grueling process. Mm -hmm. There are days when after I write, all I can do is lie down. Mm -hmm. My head is just spinning. This is the best I can do is just lie, lie down. You know, but I have the, some of the most amazing help, which I'll introduce uh, to y'all in a minute. Uh, but I think it's important to tell you before I begin this book, uh, begin reading this to you. Um, when, when They Tell Me of a Home was first released, there were several people who had read They Tell Me of a Home and said, uh, the story's not finished. Yeah. The story's not finished. There's another story in here. Come on, man. No, there's, gotta, there's another story. You got to tell us what happened. And what's so funny is um, when I write, and when the story's done, the story's done for me. You know what I mean? So when people say there's another story, I'm like, well, you write it. <laughs> I'm finished. You know? But um, uh, the stories, in this case, it came to me after I finished Perfect Peace. And it came in the strangest sort of way. It was the absolute last thing I was thinking of. In fact, I was getting ready to, to, uh, to do a, um, a new work uh, that I'm about 50 pages into now that I think you're going to really, really like called Listen to the Lambs. But that's coming. Um, and and the story came to me like all of a sudden one day. And it was this amazing spiritual experience. I saw all of this in my head and I was like, oh God, no, this is crazy. This is just really, really crazy. And I was driving in my truck. I have a 2004 Ranger and I pulled the truck over to the side, grabbed a scratch, a, a scratch of paper off my, my uh, dashboard and began to write down these ideas because I didn't want to forget it. And I, said, I stayed on the side of the road for about an hour and a half. It just it was just flowing. I was like, oh God, here's the story, here's the story. And so I rushed home, and this was probably the only time that probably in a day I did 20 pages. It just kind of flowed out, and I knew that there was a story here then. And as I kept writing, um, things were so dynamic, and things were so um, unexplained, even to me, that I would write and I would speak out loud to the computer, like, what? <laughs> it just shocked me. I was like, what the hell are you talking? How is that possible? You know? And then there are times when I say, oh no, this is crazy. I just closed it down. I gotta go. <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, and and maybe Maybe a three-fourths of the way through, I called my agent Tony, who you'll meet in a minute, said, Tony, yeah, I think I got a story here. And he was like, Well, you know, Daniel. All you have to do is just write it. You know, my agent is the coolest thing, you know. Just get it, just get it written. Send it on to me, so I finished it. And I knew I had a good story, but it wasn't quite where I wanted it to be. And then I, I went back and did my revisions, and then this whole epiphany came in. You'll see what I mean. And after that came, I was like, oh my God, this story is, this story is, just, is just crazy. But all of that to say, that's just one piece of it. There is another piece that is the craft of writing, you know, where you're 90% a reader first, in terms of just learning how to do this thing called the novel, this thing called prose, um, learning how to make ordinary writing poetic. And it is a job. It's really, truly, truly a job. The thing I'm loving is the way young people are loving my work. And the way elders love my work. It's a strange thing when you can, can really appeal to an intergenerational audience. And that has been just absolutely positively refreshing to me that just folks of all ages are, are liking the book. And that, um, that people understand that these are stories which, if we're not careful, have never gotten told. These stories of rural, country, black folks, who many of whom cannot read themselves, and certainly don't write, but are just magical people, you know, just deeply, deeply spiritual people, resilient people, brilliant people, who, quite frankly, most of the world will never meet. But I've met them. So I kind of feel like my job is to take them to the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this novel, that is what I do. Uh, I'm going to tell you. Thank you. Yes. 